Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it. And comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website and enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. I'm here talking to Mark Kohler today. He is an attorney at law and a CPA, out with a new book entitled Lawyers Are Liars, The Truth About Protecting Our Assets. And I've looked into this asset protection stuff for a long time now, folks, and I've heard a lot of sales pitches on it. And I think in the asset protection world, there are a lot of people being preyed upon that are basically being sold a lot of stuff they don't really need. But then again, how, how can you argue with you can never be too careful. So anyway, let's talk about that all today. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's an honor. Love what you're doing and your students and the people you educate and your clients. I, it's an honor to be with you guys. It's yeah. just an honor. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in the world of asset protection. I mean, society or the court system doesn't really want people to use schemes to protect assets because mm-hmm. nobody should be judgment proof. That mm-hmm. basically puts them above the law, right? Yeah. Can you really do this? I mean, well, absolutely. I mean, the, the theory of incorporating in and of itself is a legitimate way to protect yourself. And there's many things you can do with asset protection strategies. Uh, I'm sure and we'll talk in my a little bit today about my chapter about O.J. Simpson and everything. Well, yeah, his <laughs> the, retirement plan when yeah. Petrocelli attacked it. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the model, he's the like the classic asset protection model to follow, not life model, of course. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there are so many proper ways and strategies and things you can do to protect your assets. The schemes and the the scams are why I had to write a book because I'm sick and tired. As you see, many, many people get ripped off. I'm sick and tired of it. And there's no book out there as a watchdog book in asset protection. Everybody writes an asset protection book to sell their stuff, but not someone that's going to call out the the liars. And uh, that's why I had to write a book on this. I mean, it just drives you insane. Well, again, Mark, I got to compliment you on your book because it's footnoted. You back it up. It looks very, very complete. Again, I'm no expert here. I'm a layman. And I've heard a lot of these pitches, though, on asset protections. I've read a little bit about it. And what can people people do to protect their assets? Well, th- that's, a, that's a great question because the book is really divided into two halves. Here are the scams. Watch out for the scams. And so I highlight, of course, five or six scams. That's a great way to start. Maybe and, we'll start with that. What yeah. are the five or <laughs> just, just kind of bullet point on the five or six you bet, scams you bet. out there. And then the second half is what really works. So okay. we can probably dig into that later. But sure. the t- scams are the big ones, you know, just to avoid. The first one that I, of course, talk about is the silver bullet type strategy where people say you can, you can hide your assets. And whenever someone says hide or silver bullet, that's a key indication to run. Because any lawyer or planner that's helping you legitimately is going to understand there's nothing you can do for 100% protection. You can put up barriers. So whenever you see that silver bullet, one size fits all plan, that's the first scam. So watch out for that. If you're in a room with 20 other people or on a show or you're listening to a salesman and he says this is what everybody should be doing, that's the first scam out there because they think they can sell it to everybody. Everybody's different. I mean, your plan, Jason, could be very different than mine. We could both own real estate, both have a family, both have a business, which we do, but your plan could be different than mine. And, and these scam artists out there prey on the one-size-fits-all approach. That's number one. Number two is the Nevada Corporation. You and I were joking about it before the show. You know, it's just like every Tom, Dick, and Harry wants to sell on AM radio at late at night start your asset protection now. And, and, and it's just a nightmare. People don't need to go set up an entity in Nevada. It costs them additional funds. And when you come back to California, you got to pay taxes anyway here and, and register your company. Okay, so a couple comments on that. Yeah. First of all, Nevada is kind of the desirable state for small, closely held companies because Nevada is sort of a bit of a rebel state. They won't share a lot of data with the federal government, or at least they didn't used to. That's the point. Uh, and maybe they've changed that. Yeah. can imagine the feds are putting tons of pressure on them yeah. as they do on other countries around the world, and there's some examples very recently of that with Obama. The other thing about it is that if you're doing business in California, 
and you have a Nevada corp. I mean, I can't believe people fall for that one because they have what's called the domicile rules. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you got to declare income and pay taxes where you do business. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is a complicated subject and you can hire the $500 an hour Ernst & Young person to yeah. tell you about tax nexus and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Nevada does have some traits that are desirable, right? Well, actually, and this is why I have like 60 footnotes just on that chapter alone, because we hear that and we want to believe it. Now, if I'm going to be doing business in Nevada and live in Nevada, absolutely. You can save taxes. You can get better asset protection. But Jason... And, and pri- what about privacy? privacy? They claim that there's more privacy like you don't have to disclose who the officers and directors yeah, are that's the like old this. way the that's old the way. old okay, school yeah in work. fact just two months ago jason this is where i've been on some radio shows in the last two months uh-huh. is letting the world know the secretary of state has changed the laws clark county especially and all the counties of nevada have been getting the word out you now when you register your corporation in nevada you have to file a separate schedule within 60 days and disclose all the officers directors and owners nevada's sick of it they don't want you to come here and hide anymore oh okay. it, it is over. I can hide you better in about nine other states. Oh, if, really? If hiding is... It, yeah. it, it's, hiding is not necessarily what uh, you effective. should be doing. Yeah, anyway, exactly. But, yeah. It's not even effective okay. anyway. Uh-huh. So, no, the hiding in Nevada is no longer a I, realistic I know the approach. other thing that there was some... There was the connection between the individual and the entity. Uh-huh. So... I had heard a while back that in Nevada, like, you didn't need to provide a social security number to open a bank account. I assume this has all changed with the Patriot Act and, you know, all this kind of stuff. There is a lot of wives' tales of what you could get away with in an entity in Nevada. And you'd hire someone to be your registered agent, and Mm -hmm. they'd be your proxy. And then you'd never really have the stock certificates. Guys, for the last 10 years, I've been fighting. Hokey. Hokey. Yeah, yeah, just case after case of people getting ripped off Uh because these are non-lawyers, typically. Mm -hmm. um, Scammers that move from one industry to the next. Mm -hmm. And we've seen them just... We've got them in real estate, Yeah, they'll they'll (laughs) jump over to mortgages one day. They'll jump back to... You know, <laughs> loan modification the next. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just nuts. So anyway, folks, if you think you're going to be able to hide out in Nevada, think twice. And here's the problem. Once you step your foot over the border into California, Arizona, Utah, all these border states get this. Once you step across the border and do business in another state or live in another state, all those benefits are gone. There's no tax savings. And once you register in California, you avail yourselves of California law. So now if you did get a little bit better asset protection in Nevada, That's only if you're doing business there. Once you come across the border here and you're in California, I got California law to deal with. So I'm not getting any of those benefits. They're all half-truths. And you see it in the airport in Nevada. Do business here. You do get all these benefits. Well, that's if you stay doing business there. If you live in Nevada, once you cross the border, all that's gone. It's just a... It's, it's I got to tell you something. There is a very posh area here right near us in Orange County, and it's called Crystal Cove. And in Crystal Cove, it feels like about... 30, 40 percent of the license plates on the cars say Nevada. Yeah. These are obviously people who have registered their car in Nevada because they don't want to pay. They want to either establish residency or so they don't have to pay California income tax or, or whatever they're pulling. But this is just like amazing. I mean, you know, the, the government has got to be wise to this stuff. They, you they know? do. And, and absolutely. And here's the important point, too, is a lot of times these elaborate structures are more costly than they're worth. You know, you jump through all these hoops and you've got some planner you think's changing the world with your assets and you know, no one's going to find you. And then come to find out you're paying for more tax returns, more administrative fees, more filing fees. And then you've got to, and, and you've always got that sick feeling in your stomach that, oh my gosh, the IRS could knock on my door tomorrow or the Secretary of State of California or Nevada and Franchise Tax Board. And Franchise Tax Board in California is not screwing around with this. Oh, tell me about it. They're, yeah. they're, they're mean, I hear, yeah. Yeah, once you have a bank account in California, they're finding out, are you trying to do business here? There's several cases right now pending on this $800 minimum tax. People that try to set up their Nevada company say, well, I'm really just doing business on the web. I live in California, but I have a home office, but I don't do much. And California's saying, no way. You're paying your 800 minimum tax here. And that's the annual fee for having the entity and the domicile in California, right? Well, there's an annual Secretary of State fee, okay. and then there's the Franchise Tax Board minimum tax. Mm-hmm. And the more income you have, it gets you got to have some serious income before right. it exceeds 800. But all the corporations in LLC, it's actually a minimum tax. It could be higher mm-hmm. based on your income. Then you have your annual fee to the Secretary of State. So and that varies from 50 to 100. Yeah, you know, I think the thing the listeners really have to realize is this, is that when you've got a state, and that means a state meaning a country or a state within the country, either way, the state in general, when the state is hungry for money, and boy, 
It is at both the federal and the state level in pretty much every state in the union now and other countries around the world. When the state is hungry for money, they're going to find ways to come after people to get it yeah. and make sure that people are complying. So you don't want to live your life worried about a knock on the door, or the registered letter that right. comes in the mail. You want to just do things right so you don't have to worry about that stuff. You can get a lot further in life, I think, by just playing the game right but smart. And take advantage of every legal opportunity there is to protect assets, to reduce your tax uh, liability. Certainly, that's all fair and well and good. But don't fall for these hokey scams. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the purpose of this book. When you said, you just said it, Jason, when you play it smart, when you work it smart, you have to be at least reasonably educated on these topics. I mm -hmm. want clients to not be experts, but captains of their own ship. So this is a great opportunity. And this is why this book is not a John Grisham. This is a reference manual. Uh -huh. So when you're out and you're doing business, Business, you're at a REA meeting, I should say. Or, but if you're out there and you're doing deals and you're talking to your advisor and they bring up a strategy, for again, again, one of the other scams, land trusts. Land trusts can be very effective in transactions, but they're not built for asset protection. Tell, That's tell, another the, tell the listeners what a land trust is, real quick. Well, you may, some of you scam. may have heard this. You know, um, there's a lot of gurus out there that I use know. Them. land trusts. <laughs> every, what the, the principal purpose of a land trust is to hold property through the use of an internal document. It's not registered publicly. Um, this trust document is going to set forth beneficiaries that are generally undisclosed, and then there's a trustee for that trust. And it's a great, uh, that document can be very helpful in buying property in a subject to scenario with short sale strategies. There's a lot of great real estate strategies that use land trusts very effectively. I, um, I help draft land trusts for our clients around the country. But the problem is, is these gurus out there that say, oh yeah, but use the land trust to hide yourself, hide your assets, hide, 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 silver bullet protection. There's a, literally a book on silver bullet land trust protection. Okay. Give me a break. Now, maybe a land trust is camouflage but it's not a bulletproof vest. Okay. And, and the land trust should not be used for asset protection. That's what corporations and LLCs and our other structures are built for, not land trusts. Okay, all right. So, so I think you've gone over three scams, yes. okay? The Nevada sort of, we'll just call it the Nevada scam. Yes, there you go. Okay, and then the land trust and what was the other Silver bullet. Silver, Silver bullet. Bullet. Oh, the, yeah. the all, all you know, this one. will do it all type yeah. thing. Okay, all right, what else? Number four, you're going to love this, offshore planning. Oh, yeah. A lot of times is your wealth builds. These are the next layer of scammer hearts. Right. They're not going after the brand new mom and pops operations. They're going out there after those folks that have been around a while. They, they've learned these techniques that Nevada doesn't cut it, land trust, and these people want more. How can I really protect so myself? That's the guy in the Cayman Islands, the Cook Islands, the Isle of Man, there all of those go, tax man. havens. And I tell you, I, re I remember it was funny because this girl I used to date a long time ago, after me, she got with this guy, and I think she married him, actually. And then her brother kept telling me they were always traveling to all these tax haven countries <laughs> and talking about moving to one. <laughs> and I thought, what are they up to? You know? yep, yep. <laughs> this is some crazy thing. I mean, I, I've heard that if you fly to these places too often, the IRS will probably audit you. You. Yeah, right. And right now we're in a major situation with the Swiss banks. Yeah, and well, well, Obama really just yeah. said, look, you got to come clean on you all this come stuff. Clean. And you know what? The listeners ought to really understand the way this works internationally. Yeah. And yeah. from my, from what I gather, it works like this. These countries, the U.S. obviously is this huge empire and we're doing favors all over the world, getting involved in everybody's business, which we shouldn't, but that's another topic. <laughs> but, but whenever there's a hurricane on some one of these islands where people are hiding money and they need aid, the U.S. says, you got to disclose the accounts. You got to come clean on this stuff. They use the Patriot Act, all this stuff. And they're really pressuring these other countries like the Swiss. And UBS, I know, turned over all those accounts. And yeah. the U.S. is going to figure it out. You got to pay tax on all income worldwide, right? Absolutely. And there's two things going on. There's asset protection offshore, and then there's tax planning offshore. And in this book, I talk about the asset protection aspect as well as taxes. But the bigger issue is can people hide their assets offshore? And with, like you said, at Patriot One and Two, and they're, trust me, if you're moving money offshore, there's some guy in the basement of the Pentagon with a little headset watching and, and looking at your transaction. I mean, it yeah. just money does not move offshore anymore without it being watched. You might period. be accused of being a terrorist or something, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And now here's the thing does asset protection offshore work? Yes. It does make it harder for people to get at your assets in a lawsuit. Now, are we talking about hiding from the IRS? Absolutely not. You're taxed on your worldwide income. We want you to be full disclosure with the government. And you're not hiding when you're going offshore. You're just putting up another barrier. And so here's the scam. People will go out and sell this elaborate offshore planning strategy to the folks that don't have the assets 
to afford it or it makes sense. Now, if, if they don't need it, they don't it's need overkill. it. Yeah, it yeah. is absolutely overkill. And so it's oversold, but I need to say it works. And again, we're not trying to hide from the IRS. You know, I've got another chapter coming out on Wesley Snipes. You know, we don't want it, the IRS throwing us in jail. He's in trouble now. What's oh, going to yeah. happen to him? I mean, well, is he's he going to go to jail? Yeah, he's in jail now. Oh, he went to jail. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, wow. he's just sitting there. And, How long? Well, with the, no one knows it's going to be like this two to year, two to three year thing. And, wow. and uh, He's got a probation coming up, but uh, yeah, you haven't seen it in a movie. Don't lately. mess with this stuff, folks. Yeah, this is serious. It's scary, yeah. yeah. So it's it's a, there's a lot of examples out there of how to watch yourself when you when someone's saying hide your assets to save taxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a whole other topic, and it's just crazy. So okay, and, so we should distinguish between asset protection from liability in say a lawsuit or something like that, and and tax liability. Those yeah. are two different topics. Yeah, when you're going offshore, yeah. people get kind of sold that double whammy: okay. save save on the IRS. You know, hide your income and hide your assets, and they go in a double. Okay, now let me ask you this. I remember hearing or reading, Mark, about a case, so oh, I don't know, three, four years ago or something. And, you know, you just kind of hear these things vaguely, and I'm not an expert, but I kind of tune in. One of them was some business person got sued and lost, and the other party got a judgment against them, and then the business person claims, I don't have any money. Yeah. <laughs> and the judge says, well... We think you do, and I'm going to just let you cool your heels in jail yep. until you figure out how to make this money get here. I think actually it went more like this. He he said he had money, but it was offshore in another entity he didn't control. And the judge just said, look, I don't believe that. You better figure out how to control it because the reality is the judge was wise and knew it was probably one of these asset protection schemes, right? Absolutely. And in fact, in my chapter on that topic, I quote some of the cases that were just like that. There's, there's a variety of them. Uh-huh. Affordable Media and Goldberg versus Lawrence. There was a lot of those cases where folks are charged with contempt of court for mm-hmm. essentially lying to the judge. Right. So he says, you can go to jail. And when you want to bring that money back to the U.S., uh, you can get out of jail. Until then, prove that I violated the Constitution, and the, and, a, and the court, of course, wins in those cases. So now, again, does it make it hard for someone to get after your assets if you're going to go to that layer uh, or level of protection? It does, but uh, the government's got a, a long arm, so we need to be careful. Now, Other the, scams. Yeah, There's one. like two Jason, more. Jason, you're oh, going to love one. this. Okay, last one. Right. And this is a, a, the chapter that I, I finished the first section with is, um, you know, the biggest threat against your assets is yourself. It's you and me. Jason, there's so many times, and I know you probably fall prey to this too, we think we're above the scam. It's mm-hmm. not going to happen to us. Right. We, we do partnerships on a handshake. Mm-hmm. We don't fill out the LLC the way we should have. We don't have an operating agreement. We do everything on a napkin at Denny's. Mm-hmm. And that is our biggest threat to an asset protection lawsuit is our partnerships and our marriages. People go into marriage when they should have had a prenup. They mm-hmm. should be doing a postnup because mar- marriage is on the rocks, but they don't do it. And people do so many business deals without proper documentation. And that is the biggest threat to people's assets. And it's so hard to take that time to, to document things carefully. And people, oh, it's so important. Yeah. Just, it, you're the biggest threat to your own assets. Okay, and, so and, just not setting stuff up right. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with entities or things like that. Well, what do you mean in the partnerships? Well, well, Tell what us I about mean by that. that. You Part- mean in a general partnership, you, you have unlimited liability to general partners, yeah, right? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah, what I'm saying is, Jason, your number one potential for a lawsuit, Jason, uh-huh. is not getting hit in a car or car accident tomorrow uh-huh. night. It's your partner. You've undocumented something that you should have had in a partnership agreement. Mm-hmm. How are we going to split profit? How are we going to share this or share this deal or that? And your partner feels like he's putting in more time or money or they should have got paid more. And that's where the lawsuits come from. That's the majority of lawsuits and in the court system. And that's in a business partnership, right? Yeah. Because usually like on a real estate deal, if you're just taking title tenants in common and the property oh. has insurance, I mean – Oh, Jason, Tell seriously. me about that. Yeah, what, like you what? go into a tick on a deal and you're on tenants. No, no, not, not in a tick. I hate ticks. Well, ticks yeah. are a well. scam. I just read about a huge one that was right here. And I'll tell you this. This is a company called 41031. Mm-hmm. Okay. And they were doing company with this. Uh, they were doing business with this like master leasing agreement through this entity called DBSI that had been around for decades. And they kept pitching us to get into that. And they wanted to come into our meetings and talk to our investors. And I said, look, that violates commandment number three of my Ten Commandments, which is thou shalt maintain control, be a direct investor, control your own investments. But that doesn't mean that there might not be a deal, because I've had partnerships in real estate before, where as long as one person doesn't live in the property, okay, and it's a, both arm's length for both partners, mm-hmm. you know, those partnerships are pretty simple. You're really just splitting expenses, splitting tax benefits. 
I haven't had problems with those. Some of them I've had for years and years. But what I mean is don't invest in a fund where you don't control it or someone else does. I don't like those kind of deals. The the tick, when I said tick, that has a lot of loaded language because a tenant in common is a tick. And then there's these tick funds and all that stuff. I could buy a a fourplex with you and we could buy it tenants in common between the two of us. That just is how we will our half. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, but here's the thing. And first of all, I want to create the caveat here or make the caveat. I I have nothing against partnerships. I think that's the, the, the best way to do business. Synergizing capital and experience and leveraging time and effort. Awesome. But documenting it properly is the big deal. If, so you and I going on a deal, Jason, we see a little duplex down the street. Mm-hmm. Great. Let's go in tenants in common. And then we don't put into place a partnership agreement. It's all done via email okay. or a handshake. And then what happens if you think we need to improve the property. You don't like the tenant. Or what happens if we need to put more money in? Or you get then hit by a bus. Then we have an argument. And then we have an argument. And then you want to sell. I don't want to sell. And no, 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 no. And that's where the fight gets. And, and it's hard to get out of a property with a situation of a tick in that the court has to get involved to bifurcate the sale, force the sale. There's no buy-sell provisions. It's just... I just wish more clients would take the time to document yeah, properly. Right. And it doesn't have to always be an LLC. Uh-huh. It could be a joint venture agreement, something. But we've got to be careful. Sure. So that's, okay. that's that last scam is people not taking care of uh, that good housekeeping skills. Okay, know? so yeah. what are the cures? What are the ways to do it right? Well, there's a variety of strategies based on your situation. And how I, I, I make sense of this in my book and for folks, and this is going to be, again, a huge resource to many of your, your listeners and your members, is that I create the story of a, um, a medieval battlefield where your castle and your assets are at one end of this huge uh, rolling hills of, of land. And how are we going to protect those assets? And frankly, the more assets you have, the more protections required. So the first point that I make to clients is that you've got to realize it's a, it's a barrier process. And some clients that don't have a lot of assets, it can be very simple and affordable. I have a whole section on exemptions, protection with your homestead exemption. And then you've got the tenancy by the entirety and your retirement plan exemptions and your uh, all of these little easy statutory laws that you can take ex- advantage of. Well, I call those battlefield strategies, simple, affordable things you can do. And in those are included setting up an entity. Uh, if you're going to do business or you're going to buy a piece of real estate, is it an LLC? Is it limited partnership? Is it a, uh, is it a corporation? And that's where the tax factors come into play. And there's so many people giving asset protection advice that know nothing about taxes. And that's really the difference in a lot of these entities. So I, I go through that, making sure that those basic fundamental battlefield strategies are taken care of. Then we can add the moat and the barricades and the earthworks that might include umbrella insurance and more multi-entity structuring or family limited partnerships or just a whole host of easier, more basic strategies, the more, you know, a little more successful investor might need to take advantage of. And then I have the fortifying the castle strategies. And these are strategies that are more elaborate. They take a little more work and cost. Uh, You're typically going to involve trust work and maybe offshore planning and asset protection strategies that we call DAPs, sometimes domestic asset protection trusts. The word trust, can you just explain? Everybody pretty much nowadays knows what a corporation is. There are two types, a C-corp and an S-corp. Everyone pretty much knows what an LLC is. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about trust, there are so many different types of trust. Maybe just to find for the listeners, if you would, Mark, what is a trust and how many different types are there? I mean, there's like an endless... You bet. And Jason, I'm glad you asked that question. Could you just caught me rattling? Uh I mean, I was just rambling. And the hard part about that is, is there are just a toolbox of so many little asset protection strategies based on your situation. And so when I start rambling, I'm glad that you stopped me and said, Mark, just stop, take a breath. What is a trust even? Because again, a lot of these strategies we don't have to be experts in. But a trust is going to be a fundamental tool in that toolbox. A trust is oftentimes, most oftentimes, nothing that you're going to record. It's very private. And there's charitable trusts, irrevocable trusts, revocable trusts, um, living trusts. Spendthrift trusts. Spendthrift trusts. Beneficiary defective trusts trusts, offshore trusts. I mean, there's there's just trusts go on and on. But the basic fundamental principle is there's three pieces to a trust. There's a grantor,
for someone that's going to create this trust and put property into it. There's a trustee, someone that's going to manage it, and it could be you or someone else. The, when you manage it, it's typically going to be a revocable living trust, and you're in control, and there's real no asset protection benefit. And there's revocable living trusts are an important part of an, asset, uh, an estate plan. And then the third piece is the beneficiary. Who's going to be the beneficiary during your life? It could be you. It could be children or grandchildren or someone else. And so with that basic definition or understanding, then things get more elaborate from there. There might be a charitable beneficiary. Uh, you might have life insurance as the key asset in the trust. It might be real estate. Uh, you might be the trustee. You might not be. Is it irrevocable? Is it revocable? And so when you sit down with a planner, now this is, this is the point, Jason, is that when you sit down and look at your strategies and what is the advisor that you've been working with telling you is what they're saying makes sense do we have at least a basic understanding of it do we have a weird feeling that maybe this sounds too good to be true is it more elaborate than it should be when those red flags go up in our minds where do we turn and and sometimes we turn to a second opinion is is there an attorney that we can trust out there and that's where in the last 10 years it's just we've built our business and this is what this book's about is that giving people a resource you know mark i think one of the reasons there's so many scams in this asset protection world is that number one the buyers of it they don't really know what they're buying but number two is this area of the law doesn't get a lot of it doesn't get a lot of publicity. Everyone kind of knows that, oh, they might have a claim against them someday that could cause them to lose their their money that they've saved and worked hard for and invested. But it seems like a lot of these groups, they just sort of sell people stuff, and then it's either never tested, hopefully it's never tested, mm -hmm. but if it is tested, it's years, many years hence, and that lawyer isn't around or that company isn't around, and you just sort of don't know whatever happens to it. Well, I think that's a, a good point that that's where people get away with making promises and asset protection because who knows when that fateful day will be. And for 90% of the folks, that day never comes. So those promises were never tested. That's why I threw 250, 300 footnotes in my book of showing over the last 50 years what's worked and what hasn't. So at least we have a roadmap of the past and that those promises that people make, we can rely on something. But this is such a, a great point, Jason. People, I've been on several TV shows and I feel like John the Baptist. I mean, I'm out there in the wilderness trying to tell people how important this is. And it's amazing. You've seen it in your, in your groups out there as you talk about this. 50% of Americans operate as a sole proprietor. It, they just think that's the way to do it. That's terrible. Boy, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 And they're, they're just sole proprietors. They don't trust lawyers. They're apathetic. They're frustrated. And that's really the group that saddens me the most is that people just give up and they don't do any asset protection at all. And or tax planning. I mean, that's my next book. I mean, I, they go hand in hand is, is the tax planning. Yeah. Yeah. It's no so question important. about that. Tell us about the OJ case a little bit, because mm -hmm. as I understand it, OJ did two things. Well, number one, he had a big retirement plan and the retirement plan is kind of like a separate entity. It's not subject to judgments, right? So it is not. Dan Daniel Petrocelli got that judgment for what, 33 million bucks against him yep. on the civil case and couldn't touch it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And he wrote a book about it. Could mm -hmm. he, they could touch the revenue from the book sales, but his retirement plan, they still could not touch. But what about when he takes money out of the plan? When he takes distributions, isn't that subject to no, the judgment? No, still can't grab it. Really? Yeah, it's amazing. And Jason, this is an important point I talk to real estate investors a lot about. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that are listening, obviously, you wouldn't be listening to Jason if you didn't believe in real estate as at least a part of your portfolio, which I wholeheartedly believe in as a CPA and an attorney. This is very, very important. Well, when you do real estate, there's two types of real estate investors. There's the ordinary income, operational, I'm going to turn property quickly, create ordinary income strategy. And then there's the buy and hold or take more time, passive income strategy. Well, with a passive income strategy in rental property, there's not much opportunity for a retirement plan. There, there just isn't. But for those real estate investors that are creating an ordinary income with a fix and flip, a short sale, a wholesale strategy, or some sort of rehabbing process, they got a lot of tax liability. They've got there. more tax yeah, liability, yeah. yeah. So where does this come in? The retirement plan. Mm -hmm. I love talking about the self-directed individual retirement plan, the 401k, because it's just what OJ had. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing the NFL set up for him. So Jason, when, you, when real estate investors catch the vision of this, they can shelter so much income from their short-term real estate strategies and completely asset protect it. But they've got to put it in the plan. They can't have the money. No, they've got to put it in the plan, and then they can keep buying real estate with it. I mean, with the 
plan. With the right. plan. I mean, I mean, obviously, anybody in real estate has heard about self-directing. It's yeah. nuts, the benefits of that. So here's the point. I mean, literally, you could rehab a property tomorrow, make, say, 20 or 30 grand on it, take that money, put it into a 401k plan, and the, pr- and the contribution limits far exceed IRAs. My clients don't do IRAs. Forget it. We're using health savings accounts on 401ks, baby. But once that money's in that 401k on day two, you could literally be drunk driving tonight. I mean, that sounds terrible. You mm-hmm. could be out and kill someone on the freeway. Oh, God. Yeah. And, and no one could touch your 401k. Right. So not only are you getting tax benefits, you're allowed to continue investing it the way you want to. Mm-hmm. Now you can be completely asset protected. And that's that O.J. Simpson model that so many people have been shocked about. Well, the other thing O.J. did is that's why he moved to Florida, right? Yeah. Because they had an, either an unlimited homestead exemption or a $1 million, I can't remember. It's un- unlimited in okay. Florida. So, so you might own a $5 million, $20 million house in Florida, and if you own that house just outright, yeah. All of that value of that real estate, that well, it's got to be your personal residence, though. It can't yes, be an yes, investment property. Yes, uh-huh. All of that property that you live in, it's sheltered. They can't touch that. They can't force you to sell it. They can't do anything, right? Oh, no. Yeah, it's amazing. And yeah. I know you've got listeners from around the country listening. And this is why in the back of my book, I have four different tables, appendices, going over LLC and LP variations, something we ought to talk about too, Jason. But this is, I have a whole table on the homestead exemptions. It's table C. And different states have different rules for this homestead exemption. You have unlimited exemptions in, in Florida, Iowa, Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, states where if you move your domicile to those states, no one can ever touch the value of your home. And OJ saw it coming. I mean, he moved his domicile even before the criminal court proceedings were over. He moved his assets to Florida, bought his home in Florida, and it's never been touched since. Wow. And it's just unbelievable. So using the homestead exemption and using retirement plan exemptions, and I have a whole table in the back of the book about your retirement plan. How is it going to be treated in your state? Now, IRAs now, are very different than now, 401ks. Now, just one question on the OJ thing. So OJ's in jail now. Yeah. Uh, finally, they got yeah. him for something else. Yeah. And Richest man in Clark County Jail. <laughs> that's probably true. Still getting his retirement plan. <laughs> and uh, but there are a lot of other criminals outside of Clark County Jail that you know are, are free, uh, but yeah. um, and, and they're even richer. But if he sells that house in Florida, then he loses the homestead, right? And all the money from that sale is well, open to judgment, or no? No, because that's the theory. Is that? Oh, that's a great question. I apologize here. I probably need to I'm just brush up on my I'm just curious because, you know, yeah. why would he want to keep the house? He's in jail, right? Maybe he wants to liquidate that. Yeah. And if he does, maybe then it becomes... Yeah. That's the thing is that a judgment cannot force the sale of your home. Now, if okay. you were to sell it and take that cash... The cash would, is available. Would it be judgment. subject? Yeah. And, you know, I don't know the answer yeah. to that. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm thinking gotta, it probably... i got to write a note. This yeah. is in my second edition. What, what did you want to talk <laughs> about in the table that you mentioned, the differences between the oh, LLCs now, and, and now what? This is an important yeah. point, Jason. A lot of people people don't realize this. A lot of folks say, oh, I'm going to set up my LLC to uh, protect my rentals, to protect my real estate. I'm going to set up an LLC. Now, that is a very loaded statement because the LLC is built in all 50 states to protect you from the rental, but it's not to protect the rental from you. So, for example, you get in that same car accident tonight and someone comes after you right. for killing someone. Right, it doesn't someone. work. The, the shield is not, not that other way. In That's right. Yeah. Do you have inside and mm-hmm. outside uh, protection. And I call this a charging order protection entity, something Jay Adkinson, a guy I quote in my book quite a bit, he's an excellent attorney around the country on this. The charging order protection entity is very important. So folks, don't gloss over here. What I'm talking about here is an LLC protects you from the rental. If something goes wrong with the rental, some renter gets hurt, and there's mold, or there's a fall, someone falls off a balcony, you're protected as long as you weren't a slum landlord. Landlord. But if you get in that car accident tonight, can they get inside that LLC and liquidate that property sure and take can. it? Yeah. They can. Is there a way to protect that? Well, in 13 states, Which you have protection yeah. outside. So you can't get in the LLC either. Oh. You from both directions. Which states are those? Well, let's we can rattle let's through those. Let's read the book. Jason. You yeah, got well, the book? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we can go through these. We call these charging order states. And this is um, Appendix E. As you look at it, Jason, it's the last appendix. What page? Um, uh, page 231. Okay. And you can look at column five of charging order states. Now, some of these are important now, states. Now, explain to the listeners what a charging order is. A charging order is if, if you got in that car accident tonight from drunk driving, I'm just continuing 
with that theme. I apologize. Do I know that. Do you keep mentioning that because drunk driving insurance doesn't cover it or something? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're dealing with a felony, uh-huh. and so uh, people are going to your your umbrella insurance isn't going to cover you. Your auto insurance isn't going to protect you. So people are going to come after your assets at that point. And so, do you have a homestead exemption? Do you have a retirement plan? Do you have a charging order protection entity? So here's the issue: uh, a charging order is a judge that makes an order. So here's the judge saying. If I charge, I charge you, Mark, to not to pay any money that comes out of this entity, this LLC, I charge you, I make an order of the court that you are to pay any money that comes out of that LLC to these people you've harmed. And that's the charging order. Well, the judge in these 13 states can't force you to sell what's in the LLC. He can only make a charging order that you're going to give any of the money that comes out of the LLC to these people. That's the order. That's the charging order. So if you want, most of us want, a charging order protection entity because they can't foreclose on the LLC or dissolve the LLC, all they can give you is a charging order to pay any money. And of course, what do you do? Most, most lawyers walk away from this because they know that you're not going to take any money out of the LLC. And so it's a waste of time. So important states that would affect us here on the West are Arizona, Alaska, uh, Idaho. So what column are we looking at? We're column five, column okay. five, and you want to have an entity in that area. Now, this is where Nevada jumps in. Nevada is asset protection from the outside. Um, you've got New Jersey on the East Coast, Oklahoma, Utah, and Wyoming. So California is a hard one. An LLC in California does not protect the asset from you. It protects you from the renters. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Now, if we go to a limited partnership... Now we've got charging order protection. See, if you look at column two, most states have limited partnership charging order protection. So folks listening but here. But is that only if you're the limited partner? Or is that, what if you're the general partner? Well, I would never make you a general partner, Jason. Your corporation would be the general partner. So they'd have to get through the corporation, and they couldn't do that either. Okay. So the limited partnership, so folks, here's an important point, Jason. Right. You're going to yeah. love I this. See, I see the strategy. Yeah. yeah. A lot of seminars you go to, people sell the limited partnership mm-hmm. because it gives you better asset protection. Now, is this a family limited partnership, or yeah. is it just a limited partnership? In, in asset protection world, it could be either one. Okay. If it's, if it's all family members, then it's an FLP, family right. limited I've partnership. I've heard that one used a lot. Yeah, and it's great. It's good. Now, we use it for estate tax planning and all sorts of good stuff. So here's the point. When you go out to a seminar and people say, oh, in California, you need a limited partnership. They're better asset protection. They're right. In California, a limited partnership is better than an LLC. But here's the caveat. The IRS throws a wrench into this. And this is, a, this is the earth shattering. This is the golden nugget of my book, Jason. You're going to love this. A LLC doesn't give you as good of asset protection, but it gives you better tax write-offs. Because when that depreciation and flow-through losses come from your rental property, which are a huge benefit of rental real estate, you know that. When those losses come through, you can write those off against your ordinary income as a real estate professional and active investor, but only if they come through an LLC. You can't do that with a limited partnership. So I don't have my clients put their rentals in limited partnerships because we don't get the tax benefit. So I use limited partnerships for the beach house, the second home, the cabin, the racehorses, the cash accounts, the Merrill Lynch account, because they're charge in order protected. God, don't have an account at Merrill Lynch. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah you're so funny, Jason. I love it. But where do we put our rentals? Even, we put those in LLCs. And you may say, well, Mark, I'm not getting the best asset protection in California. Well, here's the point. You're going to carry umbrella insurance anyway. You're going to ha- be stripping equity to buy more rentals as well. Right. And your exposure is going to be very much li- – you're going to have two layers of insurance going. You've got your LLC. It's going to be hard for someone – not impossible, but like an LP. But it's going to be hard for someone to get in your LLC, but you're going to get the tax benefits. This is where comprehensive planning – the rubber meets the road. This is where it really is at. So the LP LLC distinction is a whole chapter in my book. Got a whole table on it because I want real estate investors to understand those differences because the tax man could screw up your asset protection plan. It's crazy. Oh, oh yeah. This is complicated stuff. One of the things that really sounds like a good opportunity to me, and we've had people come and speak on it at our, our groups, is the series LLC. Very true. And I noticed that. I asked you about it because you've got it here in column six. Now, only a few states do the series LLC, but this seems like a really efficient way because you can just have one LLC, put all your real estate in it, maybe. I mean, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm hoping this is all true. Yeah. You can tell me in a minute. <laughs> 
Uh, right. But my assumption is you can have one LLC, put all your real estate in it, and have maybe, I know that some have like 16 sort of separate compartments or mm-hmm. firewalls, mm-hmm. and you don't have to file 16 tax returns. You yes. know, that's really nice and keep 16 sets of books and just have one. And is it just one bank account? Can you have one bank account or you've got to separate the bank accounts? You, you've got to separate the bank accounts. Okay. Now, and, and let me define this. And uh, yeah. You're right on, Jason. So tell everybody what a series LLC yeah, is. You're, you you're right on. You're very bright, Jason. Yeah. I've been so impressed with you. And, and you, you've got... Be you, careful. I'm no lawyer, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a hack. Well, you know what you've got is yeah. you're the captain of your own ship. Yeah. You've got the type of knowledge that I want my real estate investors to have. Yeah. You're not going to go out and do your own entity. You're not going to do it online. You're not going to use LegalZoom. You're going to use a planner. But you know enough that the planner isn't going to take advantage of of you and they're not going to sell you crap you don't need and that that's that's the type of education I want my clients to get with their tax and legal advisor so anyway as series LLC folks if you've never heard of this a series LLC is a special LLC where you can have sub series and you can have as many as you want. You can have 16, you can have 5, 3, 2, whatever you want. Can you have more than 16? You can have 20, 100. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you can have as many sub-series as you want. So I have clients, like, for example, a client this week I was working with has 42 rental properties in Oklahoma. So we set up a series LLC that had about 6 to 7 sub-series. And we put about 6 to 7 properties in each sub. Now, why we didn't do a sub-series for every rental is because you do have to have a separate checkbook. For every sub series, because we want to, because who are the renters going to pay the rent to? They're going to pay it to that sub LLC, and you're going to collect rent in that sub LLC. So you have to have a checkbook for that sub. But the beauty is, Jason, you're right on. One big tax return at the end of the year, one filing fee to set up the LLC in the first place. So you're getting six or seven LLCs for the price of one. Now, here's the bad news for okay. those that are listening in California. Uh-huh. We've got the Terminator, and the Terminator says. If you're going to have a series LLC in California, come to our state. We would love it because we're going to tax you $800 per sub to do business in California. Oh, so they offer it in the People's Republic of California, but they, <laughs> they just charge you per sub? Yeah. So oh. you've got that $800 minimum tax per sub series. Yeah. I know. So I don't have my clients in California set up a sub series LLC. But there's six states that have series LLC. More states are coming on board with You know, this. it doesn't show that on your chart. It says California doesn't offer it. That's right. They don't is offer it. Is it new here? It's probably new. Yeah, well, now here's an important point. California does not offer the series LLC protection. Moreover, if you bring a series here, they're going to charge you $800 per sub-series. So no one does it. What do you mean bring a series here? Great point. You talked about this earlier, domesticating. So when you have set up an entity in Nevada or Utah that has a series LLC, and then you register it here in California because you're doing business in California, that means you're domesticating your corporation here. <laughs> And once you do that, once you cross the border, like your Nevada entity, right. once you set up my Nevada entity and bring it to California, i got to register it here as a foreign entity or else I don't get any protection. Once I do that, California says, great, we're going to charge you 800 bucks per entity. Oh, and if it's a sub-series, we want $800 per sub. Right. Yeah, okay. It just doesn't work here. In okay. Hey, Mark, I got to ask you for some free advice. And this example might apply to some other people listening. Absolutely, so, man. I love okay, it. Okay. okay. So, so I am working on a deal with one of our clients, listeners, he's probably okay. listening now. And we're looking to buy a pretty large property in Oklahoma. Okay. 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 And we're going to set up an LLC to buy this together. We'll fund the LLC together. Mm-hmm. And Oklahoma, I believe, has series LLCs. But in which state do we set it up? Do we set it up where the first property is? I mean, I'm in California. This person's in Oregon. Those are both totally unfriendly states pretty much on every count. (laughs) Um, uh, Except unless you need medicinal marijuana. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, then you're you're set. Then you're hooked up. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> they, they want you to be really apathetic here and, you know, stoned out of your mind. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I don't know. Yeah, you'll this, pass any law. These yeah. states are crazy. Yeah. They, they don't make any sense to me. You know, certainly not attractive to business people, but yeah. I happen to live here, so <laughs> here I am. But what do we do? Okay. Should we put a – set up an LLC in Oklahoma? And if so – Am I, I mean, I'm not doing business in California, although I'm receiving income from the property Mm -hmm. and I live in California. This is a... But the property's there. Yeah, and it's a great question, Jason. A lot of people, again, overdo it and are spending for things they don't need. If you're going to, let's say you are here in California, your partner's in Oregon, and you're going to buy a property in Oklahoma. Well, the first thing is, is we've got a great state to deal with. You've got inside, outside protection. Oklahoma. Charging in Oklahoma. And you're going to set up the entity in Oklahoma. Okay. And if, heaven forbid we set it up in California or Oregon and then register it in Oklahoma. Now we're paying filing fees in California and Oregon that right. we don't need to, a minimum tax of $800 in California, which we don't want to do. And the point is here, you are doing business in Oklahoma with that property, not in California. And so now here's the trick, though. I would want you to set up the bank account in Oklahoma 
with a national bank like Wells Fargo, well, Wachovia, where you can access branches here. But I don't want you to, to domicile the bank account here in California. This is one technique California is using right now to come after you for doing business in California. So you set up the, you travel out there, look at I, the property. I, I would think that you'd put the bank account there. Yeah. yeah. But, but here's the question. So you have a series LLC in Oklahoma, okay. for example. Uh -huh. And then what happens if you want to pop some other properties into it? Some are in Texas, some are in Georgia, some are in the Carolinas. You know what I mean? I yeah, mean, yeah, where, where great do we question. go? Yeah. Well, here's what you do is you've got, when you, this is another, just, you're asking great questions because these are the golden nuggets of the, of the book. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. No, you're just asking good questions. Okay, say I set up my series LLC in Oklahoma and you and your buddy buy three properties. So we set up two subs, one for the parent and two subs. You have completely isolated asset protection in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. They respect the series LLC. You have the cost of one LLC. You're doing business in Oklahoma. Everything's clean. Your, your bank account's in Oklahoma. Then you go buy a property in, let's use our first example, let's say Utah or Nevada, another series LLC state. Can I register my Oklahoma series in Utah or Nevada? Absolutely. So now you can immediately just file one document. It's $52 in Utah. Now you're doing business in Utah and you can set up as many subs as you want there. So now you start buying a mobile, some mobile homes or you buy some single family home college rentals, whatever it is. And now you're off and running. But, oh, now I'm going to buy I'm, some property, like you said, in Texas. So we go to our table and go, oh, now does Texas have a series LLC? No, Texas does not have a series LLC. Well, Texas is so business friendly. I love that state. Yeah. I'm surprised it doesn't. Yeah, Maybe it'll true. get one soon. Yeah, These yeah. are pretty new, right? They the are. They're LLCs. just in the last four to five years yeah. and they're growing. Yeah. So now we go to Texas with our series LLC. Will they respect the series LLC? The series, they will not. Mm -hmm. They'll consider it all one big LLC. Uh -huh. So if you go to Texas and you start doing business and buy two or three properties and do a series and you say, oh, there's a lawsuit on my property number five in Texas, but it's in a sub series, Texas will go, well, that's great. Thank you for coming to Texas and doing business, but we're going to treat your LLC as one big LLC uh, because so we don't have a series if you LLC get a statute. Judgment in Texas, it's going to attack that whole LLC. That's right. Now the sub series isolates the bubbles. You know, mm -hmm. you, so you have these little yeah. chunks. But more states are going to be getting it. Yeah. So I tell my clients, if you're going to do business in a series state, wonderful. Buy as many rentals as you can. Right. I mean, it's a great deal. But when you go out of there, we're going to use other strategies. Again, Texas, where the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. You know, mm -hmm. Texas has an unlimited homestead exemption. Yeah. and other no, Texas is great yeah, in like every other way. They just haven't gotten around <laughs> to this, and I'm sure they will. They're so business friendly yeah. there. They have no state income tax. I mean, how can you complain about Texas? <laughs> that's right. That's um, right. Okay, so what else should people know? I mean, we got to wrap this up. Mark, this has been very interesting, and the, the book looks really interesting. I can't wait to dig into it. What's the big takeaway here that the listeners should know? Obviously, they should be talking to a professional, doing something. Don't overspend for a bunch of junk you don't need. You call those mills in Nevada, and they just sell you everything under the sun. They it's, do. It's ridiculous. And, and I love that you yeah. warn you. And, and they're like telemarketers. You're yeah. talking to some moronic telemarketer <laughs> that just doesn't know anything, doesn't have any property, doesn't have any entities himself, doesn't know how this works. Yeah. The other thing I want listeners to just remember is that this seems somewhat simple at first, but when you start getting all these separate bank accounts, and all these separate sets of books and all these separate tax returns because I do this. You know, I have a few different corporations and man, it just starts complicating your life pretty quickly. Yeah. Keep track and keep this stuff. It's got to be all be kept very separate. Yeah. You got to be very careful. The, the companies and entities can do business with each other, but they have to be treated as though they're really separate separate people exactly right? or that protection doesn't happen yeah and you know and before i give you a takeaway i just want to echo that that's a great point and in my book i talk about the administrative process uh, and, and processes that come with asset protection and and people need to look in the mirror and say how anal am i do am i going to keep track of this stuff or i'm going to throw everything in a shoebox because if you are slow down tiger let's get the right support group in there for you and and make sure it's, it's properly handled. Well, my biggest takeaway, Jason, I just think is so important, is that people need to be the captain of their own ship. And this book is a resource manual for that. What are the scams out there in asset protection? What really works? I'm working on a second edition. I've got another book coming out on this tax strategies. It's going to be the second companion book to this. These are resource manuals that people can use. And I've found people are starving for this. And they don't know where to turn. Some of the biggest gurus that I quote in my book around the country have written books on asset protection. But you can't understand the book. And, and, and then you get the gurus out there that are selling crap and their books are understandable, but they're selling garbage you don't need. 
This book is in the middle. You can read it in one flight on an airplane. It's a resource handbook that you can look at. And that's what I want to challenge people to do, is be the captain of your own ship. Understand enough to protect your assets and protect yourself from the scams that are out there and what's really going to work. And folks, you'll, you'll, you'll find strength in that. You'll feel a, to, like you'll be a much stronger investor and you'll be more successful. Yeah. Where can they get the bookmark? Lawyersorliars.com. Oh, that's a great website. <laughs> that's crazy. And I've got a video on there where you can get a sense of me and I talk about why I wrote the book. And lawyers out there, you, you hear the title and I know you want to throw a dart at me on the wall. I get some hate mail here. They and know they're liars too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wake up to the truth. Uh, no, I'm just joking. Uh, you know, the book is about the topic, Lawyers or Liars. And I talk about groups in there that call lawyers liars and all that. It's a it's an inflammatory title, but it, we've sold over 10,000 copies. It's actually been out. This is our two-year anniversary this month. So it's been out there. I'm working on a copy of this in Spanish, as well as a second edition, updating, because the laws are constantly changing. Jason, thanks for having Good me stuff. here. Mark Kohler, thank you very much. And we'll look forward to your new book on tax planning. Yeah. And uh, maybe have you back on the show to talk about that one. I would love it. And Jason, you are so awesome. Keep doing the good things you're doing out there to help investors. I think it's awesome. You do the same. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Good. Thanks. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.